here so that I, I can also uh, point out things to all of our audiences. So welcome everyone uh, to Amazing Castles Around the World. My name is Barbara Baird, as Sadia explained. Um, okay, we'll do this one. I'm a history entertainment speaker, and I enjoy sharing history in an entertaining way. And I'll be your host this evening as we explore these fascinating structures from the inside out. So, just what is a castle? Would you know one if you saw one? Well, there is a strict definition about what a castle actually is. A castle is a private or fortified residence for a monarch or a lord, which contrasts with a palace, which is a non-fortified residence. So here we have on the left, the Tower of London, which is an entire complex. It's a fortified, comp a fortified residence. And here on the right, we have <clears throat> Catherine Palace in Russia. Now, the strict definition of a castle is a, is a fortified residence, but over time, things have evolved and palaces are a form of a castle as well. But whether it's a fortified or a non-fortified residence, it has to make a statement. It has to say, I am the king, and make no mistake about that. So castles originally, with the traditional definition, are really of a defensive nature. They're a fortified base where a king or a lord could reside, as well as launch an attack. That's important. It had to be oppressive, not only in physical form, in size, but also to the oppress the psyche of the conquered people. And on the other hand, it had to be equally impressive to other monarchs, to nobles, to the clergy and the community surrounding it. Castles are not just one building. They are a walled city, if you will. They include an armory, barracks, brew house, everyone had a chapel, kennels, uh, stables, lodging for the king and queen, as well as their court members, storage barns, what was really important, that fresh water well, that helped you when your castle was under siege. Castle complexes also serve as administrative centers, courthouses, treasuries, prison, and oh my, a place of torture at times, such as the Tower of London. Hmm. So what is the oldest castle in the world? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Well, that would be the Citadel of Aleppo, built around 3000 BC in the very old city of Aleppo, Syria. Now, this structure, basically, as you can see, it's a walled city, has been around since 3000 BC. But unfortunately, earlier this year, what happened? It was a major earthquake in the area. And here's the devastation that that particular citadel sustained. And it's um, uncertain if it will ever be restored. Hopefully it will. What's the country with the most castles? Germany. Germany. They have over 25,000 castles within its borders. Amazing. Some of you may have visited some of them in Germany. Everywhere you drive, there's a castle, <laughs> such as Neuschwanstein or Hohenschwagau. This surprised me, the country with the most castles per square mile than any other country in Europe. Wales, a small country. But whenever you see a lot of castles in a country, it means there was a lot of conflict, a lot of battles. The country with the most beautiful castles in Europe, for me, that's France. And we'll, we'll see if you won't agree. Where can you find the biggest and the oldest occupied castle on earth. England. England, let's go a little further. Great Britain. Great Britain. Windsor, England, it's in Windsor, England, 25 miles west of London, a favorite of the former queen. This is Windsor Castle today, and this is just even a portion of it. Here is the <clears throat> more or less the middle ward, the upper ward. We don't even see the formal gardens and we don't even see the lower ward here. It's a magnificent structure, but guess what? It didn't start out that way. This is what it looked like initially back in the 11th century 
when <clears throat> William the Conqueror invaded England to take back the throne. He built many of what is called earth and timber castles. That's how they built them in, in France at the time. Now, this is what an earth and timber castle really looked like. It's called the Mott and Bailey design. Here you have a Mott, not a moat. This is the earthen earthworks hill. On top of it, the keep was built, the most secure portion of the actual castle. Down here in the lower ward, you have what's called the Bailey. There we would have barracks, we have that fresh water well, workshops, stables, etc. The entire Structure is surrounded by a wood fence, a palisade, and then of course, a moat, which can be either a dry moat or a wet moat. Now, if it's a dry moat, the, <clears throat> the sides of the moat are dug at such a steep level and littered with wooden spikes that intruders would have a very difficult time reaching the castle. Well, Mott and Bailey castles in earth and timber works were very popular. They were quick to build, they provided living quarters, easily defendable, actually they were portable. William the Conqueror, when he first came over and set up shop in England, he brought over one on a ship. But there was a tragic weakness with these, and that was of course fire. All it would take is for an archer to launch a fiery arrow onto a thatched roof or onto the castle keep, or the palisade or stock fence. Well, that was never going to do for William the Conqueror because he was there to stay, of course. So they adopted stone castles. It was kind of the same sort of uh, setup where the keep, now it's a stone tower. It's in the um, upper ward. You have the residence for the king or queen. There's that chapel. That has an inner curtain wall and then an outer curtain wall. And of course you have the moat, which could be dry or wet. Most of the time, castles were built in strategic locations on waterfront or at a very, on top of a high hill or mountain. For strategic purposes, everything was built for defensive purposes. For example, here, we have the entrance to a castle and it looks like there's like two towers here. They look kind of uh, snazzy. Looks like they have a crown on the top, but those are defensive purposes. They have on the top crenels and merlons. The crenels are the opening and the merlons are those little upper walls here. And this was built for archers. They would stand behind the merlin, they would load their longbow, step into the crenel and fire upon intruding forces. Here underneath those towers, <clears throat> we have what is called machicolations or better known as murder holes. What would happen there? If you got close enough to the castle and you were not welcome, you were uh, uh, greeted with uh, boiling oil or large boulders. So here are the arrow slits. Let's just go back to that previous slide. You see arrow slits here in the castles. Well, this is how those arrow slits worked. For the longbow, like this archer on the right, it's a vertical slit. But when it came to using a crossbow, which was considered one of the most deadly weapons in the medieval ages, you have the arrow slit which is in the form of a cross. Everything is built for defensive purposes, not for comfort, I might add. Then you have the drawbridge across the moat. And if you managed to get across the drawbridge, you, you were met with the portcullis. And this is a heavy gate of iron and wood with spikes on the end, which came down very quickly to keep out intruders. And if you dig it into this foyer, once again, on the roof, are murder holes. So it wasn't easy to breach a, tr a castle. Well, after William the Conqueror, who was most successful with setting up and building stone castles? That would be Edward I, King of England. He sat on the throne from 1272 to 1307. And during the late 13th, 13th century, he, better known as Longshanks, built an iron ring of castles in Wales, a day's march apart. And he employed, they didn't have architects back then, but he employed what was the equivalent of an architect, Master James of St. George, 
from the country of Savoy. Now here we have a photograph. Now, obviously that's not really King Richard the first, <clears throat> but it is the um, actor, Patrick McEwen, who played Longshanks or King Edward the first in the movie Braveheart. And if you remember and recall that movie, <clears throat> he was suppressing the people in Scotland. He wasn't very successful. He managed to suppress most of Wales and took that for the crown but the Scottish gave him one heck of a fight. So how you feel about King Edward I depends on what country you lived in. Now, if you were a British or English citizen, he was a hero. He really expanded territory for the crown. He conducted several crusades to the Middle East with the blessing of the Pope. But if you were a Scottish citizen or a Welsh citizen, you called him the hammer of the Scots. So depends where you stand, depends on where you sit in this matter. Well, here's his ring of castles. Notice he built it near the waterfront. That was important, we'll see why. Conwy Castle, Denby, Rudland, Flint Castle, Chirk. Here's some of the actual photographs of those castles today, which you can still visit. Church, Rudland, Bulmeray, and Flint Castle. Notice built on the waterways. Now, King Edward I was pretty smart about this. He knew that because there was a lot of conflict in that area, if you built near the waterfront, you would always be assured that you would have supplies in the event of a siege. Now, a siege could last a couple hours, a day, a week, and sometimes years. So you had to have provisions inside the castle. Now, let's look at Conway Castle here. It was built in only four and a half years has eight round towers with crenellated tops here, as we can see. He <clears throat> enslaved, if you will, more than 3,000 laborers and craftsmen were forced into service, including 1,500 men with shovels and picks. So they quickly built the castle. Conway Castle has two fortified gateways, like you can see here. It also has Massive stone walls or walkable, what we call stone battlements. Once again, set up for defensive purposes. And it was recently designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. What does that really mean to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site? Well, that's a landmark. It can be a physical area. It can be a building with legal protection designated by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. And it has to contain cultural, historical, and or scientific heritage of outstanding value to humanity. Many of the castles I'll feature in the program today do have UNESCO World Heritage Site designation. But let's look at that next castle that King Edward built, Carnarvon. It took more than 40 years to build, not four and a half. Actually, it took longer to build than he was on the throne. The walls, are 13 multi-angular towers, as you can see here, once again, built on a waterway. Massive walls, seven to nine feet thick. Oh man, King Edward used Carnarvon as his administrative center in Wales. Now here's a diagram. This here in the dark ink is what was built during his time on the throne and the rest was finished following his reign. Now, Carnarvon has, as I say, UNESCO designation, but is also a castle of historic significance. And the reason being, it was used for the investiture of the Prince of Wales in 1911, which eventually that prince became King George V or Queen Elizabeth II's grandfather. And again, in 1969, as indicated here in this photograph on the left, when then Prince Charles, who is now King Charles III, he was invested with the title Prince of Wales. And on September 9th last year, when we lost the queen, her son, Charles, ascended immediately to the throne and he turned around and named his eldest son, the Prince of Wales. Now, that's not always a given that it's going to go to the next son or even someone in the family. That actually is not a given. It has to be bestowed upon the individual by the current monarch. But did you ever wonder why is the British heir to the throne called 
the Prince of Wales. Well, that all goes back to King Edward I. His firstborn son was born in Wales at Carnarvon Castle, I might add. So he was born on Welsh soil. So therein started the um, <clears throat> uh, standard to name the Prince of Wales as the next heir to the British throne. So let's go across the channel to Spain. What was going on there? Here, of course, there are castles. And one that I will feature is the Alcazar de Segovia. Now in England, of course, uh, William the Conqueror, Edward I, they were taking land, they were conquering land on that peninsula. But in Spain, it was the opposite. They wanted to retake their land, they were already conquered. Between the eighth and the 15th century, the Moors were a Muslim people from North Africa, conquered Spain and they ruled it for many, many centuries until the 15th century. By the 11th century, only about one third of the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula was roughly in the Northwest under Christian rule. Well, the Spaniards had about enough of it and launched the Reconquista, a campaign to take back Spain. And so they did. And what was a pivotal castle in that campaign? The Alcazar of Segovia. Now this actually was under the ownership or the control of the Moors and the Spaniards took it back. But prior to that time, that is an outpost of the Roman empire. So the Moors built the castle on what was left over from one of the forts from the Roman Empire. It's one of the most famous medieval castles in the world and one of the most visited in Spain. Has anyone in this room been there? Beautiful. It was You enjoyed it, I'm sure. Very impressive. I'm always amazed when you see these castles, how did they ever build them? They did not have modern building materials like we have today, you know, with cranes and bulldozers. And they always built them, in many cases, high up on a mountain. Imposing ship shape, as we'll see, guards the city of Se Se Segovia from a rocky perch. Now here's a diagram. You can see it kind of looks like a ship. We'll take a look at the main entrance. We'll take a look at the Tower of John, the throne room, the King's Hall, the chapel, and the armory in the Tower of Omash. Well, as I said, the Spaniards took back control of the Alcazar. It was captured in 1120 by Emperor Alfonso VI during the Reconquista. And during its thousand year in existence, the castle has served as a fortress for the Romans, for the Moors, as well as for the Spaniards. It was a royal palace for 22 Spanish monarchs. It was a royal artillery college at one time, and today it is a museum which can be visited. Now, I chose this particular castle in Spain for various reasons, not the least of which Queen Isabella I was crowned there in 1474. And she's important to Great Britain, to the United States, and especially to Spain. Queen Isabella of Castile united Spain by marrying King Ferdinand II of Aragon. You know, prior to this time, Spain was separate kingdoms. It wasn't one country. But when Isabella and Ferdinand married, the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon were united into one country, Spain. Now she also bankrolled Christopher Columbus on his voyage to discover America. And if you remember, her youngest daughter, which she didn't think would amount to much, wound up to be Queen of England, the wife of Henry VIII. So here we have an uh, entranceway and you're greeted with this tower here, very different architecture than you see in um, Scotland or England or Wales. Much of the influence of the Moorish people can be seen in the architecture. Even though Spain took back their land, many of the Moorish people either um, left the country, chose to convert, um, stayed there in Spain, and they were gifted artisans and helped to decorate the various castles. Now, in this particular tower, there are two steep spiral staircases. 
consisting of 156 steps each, which leads to the top of that tower. And here we have a spiral staircase. Almost all castles have a spiral staircase, but it is made so when you ascend the staircase, you are going clockwise. And this is for defensive purposes. If you are invading or sieging the castle and you're trying to go up the steps and you're right-handed as most people were at the time, you can't really swing your sword very easily. But if you are defending the castle and you are going down the stairs, you have a wide open stance to swing that sword and off with the intruder's heads. Here's how it looks from the top, looking down onto the city or village of Segovia. Now let's take a look inside. What do you find here? Here's the throne room where Isabella and Ferdinand held court. Look at the ceiling, coffered ceiling, gold leaf, covered in gold leaf. Here we have on the right, the Hall of the Kings. Isabella purposely built this. And here you have on the upper wall, all of the Spanish monarchs seated on their throne during the time of their reign. Here we have on the left, the Hall of the Galley, which looks like an inverted ship and was designed that way. And at the back of the hall, you have this beautiful mural, which is here on the right. And what is happening in this photo, in this mural? Queen Isabella is being crowned. Also in the um, Tower of Homage, they have a beautiful collection of armor. Now, not only did you need armor for your knights to wear while engaging in battle or jousts, if you will, uh, for entertainment, but you also had to protect your steed or your horse. That was critical. Every medieval castle has a chapel, such as this one. And many artworks are located in those castles, even to this day, such as this beautiful <clears throat> painting by Carduccio, Adoration of the Magi. So let's go a little further to France, particularly the Loire, Loire Valley, where we'll find many beautiful chateaus as they're referred to in France. But something is happening here, a sea change. We are moving from the medieval times to the Renaissance. And for French chateaus, when the Renaissance fashion rules over medieval function of defense. So now we have grand almost palaces. But the story of castles or chateaus in France is really the story of not kings and queens, but monarchs and mistresses. Here we have King Francis I. He was on the throne from 1515 to 1547. Now he had actually two wives. His first wife expired and he married <clears throat> Eleanor of Austria. But his true feelings were for his mistress here, the Duchess of Etampes. And many of the castles he built were for her. And son, like father, King Henry II, he, of course, was married to the very famous Catherine de' Medici. But his heart belonged to his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And we'll see what he did for her. Now, particularly in the marriage of King Henry II and Catherine de' Medici, they married very young. It was considered a loveless marriage but somehow they got together a couple times because they had eight children together. <clears throat> However, remember that famous interview that Princess Diana did with Martin Bashir, where she said being married to, King, to Charles was like three people in a marriage. That was what Catherine Medici faced every single day. They didn't hide the relationship between the mistress and the king. Diane was present at breakfast, lunch, dinner, for, during the Privy Council for family celebrations. But we will see Catherine got the last laugh in the end. So let's move on here. Chateau de Fontainebleau, 35 miles southeast of Paris. It was built as a hunting lodge. But in the 16th century, King Francis I transformed it very much into the castle we see today. It was his favorite residence for himself and his mistress. Uh, and the Pissolo, the Duchess of Etam. Now that was continuously inhabited for over 700 years. And when Francis I came to the throne, he had to put his mark on that hunting lodge. Here we have the gallery of Francis I, of course, named in his honor. 
And he also installed a very beautiful, um, let's say bedroom for, his, for Anne de Pisolo, where the two of them could spend some private time together. Let's look at that gallery. Constructed in 1528, first and finest example of the Renaissance. Now we are moving where beauty trumps function. The lower walls are decorated with the coat of arms of France here, as well as the emblem of the king. He was the salamander king. And the upper walls have frescoes depicting mythological scenes to illustrate the virtues of the king, but apparently monogamy was not, monogamy was not one of his virtues. So here's the um, crest of France, and then here the salamander king as well. And these beautiful frescoes on the upper walls. It's just, it's over the top in, de in decor, right? And here we have the coffered ceilings. They're very popular. You'll find them in all castles in Europe and even here in the United States. Now, this is the bedroom he built for uh, spending time with Anne. The upper walls are uh, decorated with scenes from the uh, love life of Alexander the Great. That was kind of a revelation to me. But um, in 1748, uh, the next subsequent kings uh, decided to turn that room into a staircase. That's what it is today. Now, when Francis expires, of course, his son, Henry, comes to the throne. He wants to put his mark on Fontainebleau, and he builds this beautiful ballroom. Here, coffered ceiling, every inch is covered in decor, high end. But if you look carefully on the walls, you will find this anagram. And let's take a look at it. It's got the H for Henry, the C for Catherine, and what else? The D for Diane. Like I said, Diane was everywhere. At the, at the western end, you have a beautiful fireplace with bronze statues copied from classical statues in Rome. And at the other end, you have a gallery where musicians played during the ball. But all good things come to an end, especially for Diane. When Henry expired, Catherine reclaimed the Chateau de Chenisseau, which is a very beautiful Chateau in France. Uh, Henry gave it to Diane as a little present, but um, Catherine said, I'm taking it back because I love it too. And so she did. As I say, she had, as we would say, the last laugh. She lived to see three of her sons sit on the throne of France. Now let's get back to <clears throat> the Chateau de Chambord, which is the largest chateau in the Loire Valley. 440 rooms, 80 Italianette columns, 282 fireplaces. Lord, I'm glad I don't have to clean this place. 11 types of towers and three types of chimneys. Construction began in 1519, once again as a hunting lodge. For King Francis, it took 28 years to complete. Here's the inside, once again, the spiral staircase. But this one was so over the top, it was built that you could ride a horse. You could actually be on horseback and go up the stairs. The ceiling carved in stone, of course, you see the emblem for the king, the salamander king, and the um, coat of arms of France. If you visit today, and some of you may have, beautiful tapestries adorn the walls and other furnishings there. But King Francis really only spent 72 days there, which seems a little bit curious, such a grand structure. Well, he only occupied it when they had hunting parties. So the rest of the year it was unoccupied and it was vacant. So whenever he decided, well, it's time for, to go on a hunt, he had to bring in his entire court, all the furnishings, all the wall hangings, all of his uh, <clears throat> cooks and cleaning ladies, Everyone had to be brought in just so he could spend maybe a week or two there. But when you're the king, you can do things like that, right? Now, in addition to the beautiful structure, of course, you have the formal gardens, which were reopened in 2017 at the cost of a $4 million restoration. Let's go to Germany, where there's more castles than any other country, such as Neuschwanstein here on the right. Now, this was not built for defensive purposes. 
It was somewhat of a folly, as we'll see. Built by King Ludwig II of Bavaria in 1869 on an alpine crag. How did he get all the materials and the workers up there? Still a mystery to me. Neuschwanstein literally means swan knight. He was inspired by characters in Wagner's operas. It also was the uh, blueprint for the <clears throat> Magic Kingdom Sleeping Beauty Castle. And during the high season, which is on now, they welcome it about 6,000 visitors a day. Who's been, anyone here has been there? Well, as you know, it's quite a walk up there, right? How they get 6,000 in and out, that's a miracle too. Well, Ludwig became King of Bavaria, here he is on the left, at the ripe age of 19. He was a handsome young man and loved by all of his subjects. But you know what? He really wasn't into running a country. That's not where his heart lied. He wanted to pursue artistic projects, poetry, and music. So he decided to launch a campaign to build many castles, but he used his personal funds. He was uh, quite wealthy in and of himself. And of course, <clears throat> he built these castles, did not use any money from the state, but this was used against him, of course. If his subjects had about enough of him not running the country, had him declared insane, took him custody, custody and deposed him. He was found dead the following day, floating in Lake Starnberg. Well, let's talk a little bit about Ludwig. He was intensely interested in the operas of Richard Wagner. Now, Wagner was not uh, an easy person to love. He was, had a quite off-putting personality and quite penniless had it not been for King Ludwig. He was his patron. Now, the walls of Neuschwanstein and other castles that Ludwig had built depict scenes from legends in Wagner's operas, such as Tannhauser, Tristan, Isolde, Lohengrin, and Parsifal. And Ludwig only slept there 11 nights, and then he was deposed. Well, let's take a look inside. Here's his bedroom. You can see on the upper wall are scenes from Wagner's opera, Tristan and Assault. The throne room. Now, this is an important room in any castle. Here in this one, the upper columns are made out of lapis lazuli, a semi-precious stone. Gold leaf covering the walls. Now the throne room, obviously, where the monarch would sit, it's an homage to Christian kingship, hereditary monarchy. I am on the throne by divine right. God put me here. That's what it's supposed to say. But what's missing from the throne room? The throne. He was only there 11 days. He couldn't even move the throne in. Here's his the salon or parlor, scenes from Wagner's opera Lohengrin. And even in the upper hall, Singer's Hall, once again, scenes from the opera, Percival. Now let's go a little further east to Poland. Did you ever think that the largest castle would be in Poland? I didn't, but it's the largest castle measured by land area. It's four times the enclosed area of Windsor and Windsor is big. It's the world's largest castle. It's on the Nogat River and it's, consists of 30 million bricks. Now, how do they know that? Because in World War II, it was destroyed and they had to rebuild it 30 million bricks later. But before we go in, let's take a flyover. It's huge.
Wow. Has anyone here been to Malbork? Who built it? Originally constructed in the early 14th century by Teutonic Knights, a German Catholic religious order of crusaders. Now crusaders, there were the Knights Templar, the Teutonic Knights, also <clears throat> the Order of St. John. It was named, the castle was named Marienburg initially in honor of Mary, the mother of Jesus. It consists of three separate castles, a high, a middle, and a low, separated by multiple dry moats and towers. And at its peak, it housed 3,000 brothers in arms. And they are memorialized here with bronze structures in the inner courtyard. The high castle has chapter house, treasury, refectory, church, and the chapel of St. Anne where all the grand masters are entombed and you can visit them even today. Now, in the middle castle, you have uh, the grand refectory, uh, grand master's palace and an infirmary. Now, if you are one of the knights, the Teutonic knights, and you are fortunate to make it to um, <clears throat> your um, elder years, you were not put out. You could spend the rest of your life there on the castle grounds in the infirmaries if you required that. Now here's the refectory or the dining hall. Look at <clears throat> vaulted ceilings covered in wood. And if you notice here, what are these squares on the, on the floor? Well, that's the heating unit. The floors were even heated, very comfortable. Poland gets cold in the winter, right? And the lower castle, what would you find? The arsenal, stables, and of course the brewery. That would be important. Are there castles in the Far East? Of course. They too served as a defensive purposes. This is the Matsumoto Castle, as you can see here on the right, built in 1590s by the Ishikawa clan. It's known as Crow Castle because of course it's ebony facade. 23 lords, warlords ruled Matsumoto Castle until 1871 when it was taken by the city as ownership. Now it's really it consists of five stone and wood buildings with iconic, the curved roofs. Now the architecture might look different, but it is of a defensive nature. It's surrounded by a triple moat. You have an inner moat, an outer moat, and a supernumerary no moat. And here's how it looks. What about these rock chutes here? Those are the murder holes, the stone walls, the main keep. Their keep or the most secure portion of the castle is the ten chute. Main tower, it still has its original 430 year old stone facade and inner wooden gables. Ah, but what's the most even impressive is the red Azumibashi bridge, which cover, goes over the moat. It pops against the black facade of the castle. But of course, now this is built in the feng, feng shui style. It is not a straight shot. There are curves to keep out, of course, intruders and evil spirits. If you visit today, you can ascend the wood stairs to the top. But let's take a tour back to jolly old England. Tower of London, located on the north bank of the River Thames, right there in downtown London. The White Tower, which is here in the middle, was built by William the Conqueror. And the tower is a complex, it's not one building, it's a complex surrounded by two concentric defensive walls and a moat. I love this picture because of course, here we have modern London with skyscrapers and automobiles juxtaposed right next to a structure that was built in 1078. And here's a diagram. We'll start with the inner <clears throat> section, which is the white tower. Now, that's a stone tower. It was built by William the Conqueror. Since he was from France, he imported all that stone from Cannes, France. Here we have other towers built, the Bell Tower, the Bloody Tower, where Richard III in incarcerated his nephews, had them snuffed out so he could ascend to the throne. You have the Devereux Tower, where Queen Elizabeth I <clears throat> had her favorite, um, in prison because, of course, he made the major mistake of uh, raising an army against her. Now, that'll never do when you're the queen, of course. Uh, and we'll visit the Waterloo Barracks, 
the execution block and a couple of other places here. The tower has served many purposes, an armory, a prison, a treasury, a menagerie, a royal mint, and today it's home to the crown jewels. Also in the lower level of the white tower here is, um, was the torture chamber. And today it's a gift shop. But <clears throat> here's what we see on the um, innermost ward, the white tower. Impressive structure, as I say, William the Conqueror brought that stone from Cannes, France. Now it was kind of ordinary to begin with, but when Henry VIII took the throne, he had these nice little fancy towers added to the corners. Now, it was the tradition that <clears throat> the next monarch, king or queen, would come to the tower and prepare for the coronation. Well, King Henry VIII built those little, um, art, those decorative corners to impress Anne Boleyn because she was raised in France. And he wanted to impress her when she came to the tower in preparation for her coronation. But as we know, things didn't work out so good for her. But in that tower, you also see St. John's Chapel, which is kind of sparsely decorated, but it would have been the way it looked when William the Conqueror built it. Also, inside the White Tower is the museum, the Royal Armories Museum, for it has armor from various kings, Henry VIII and others. So rather than letting myself talk about it, Let's hear the curators talk about it a bit. For 350 years, visitors to the Tower of London have come to see figures of the heroic kings of England, dressed in armor and with life-size wooden horses. This is the Line of Kings, the world's longest running visitor attraction. The Line of Kings was created in the 17th century to impress visitors, but over the centuries, it's been changed and rearranged to reflect the times making our 2013 re-display the latest in the long line of spectacular shows. At first, spectacle trumped factual accuracy. The figures of the kings were created using the armors to hand, even if these were from much later periods. The armors were mounted upon life-sized carved wooden horses. By the late 17th century, a time of great instability for the monarchy, it's likely that the dual purpose of this stunning display was both to impress visitors and to convince them of the legitimacy of the monarchy and of the king's right to rule. Not all the kings of England are featured in the line of kings. Only the good and heroic ones like William the Conqueror or Henry V, hero of Agincourt. The dastardly kings were left out like Richard III, who allegedly murdered the two princes here at the Tower of London. There also aren't any queens featured in the Tower of London probably because the Royal Armouries didn't have any female armour. The line of kings continued to grow throughout history, William III, George I and George II being added upon their deaths, so that by 1768 there were 17 kings in the line. George III, however, was never added to it. In the 19th century, the passion for scholarship and research led to a redisplay of the line of kings based on factual accuracy rather than showmanship. Many kings, such as William the Conqueror, Edward I and Edward III, were forced out. And in 1827, finally, James II took his place in the line. Today's line of kings features the fabulous armors of Henry VIII, Charles I and Charles II. We've also got on display some of the very old wooden horses, some of which date back to 1688. There are also some wonderful and curious items on display from the Royal Armouries collections that have been used over the years to tell some tall tales. Mm. These include a giant's armour that just belonged to a very large man and a suit of armour belonging to a dwarf, in reality a small boy. And there's also a Japanese suit of armour. Welcome to the Line of Kings, the world's longest running visitor attraction. <laughs> Well, as you noticed in this uh, little brief video, they make a point of saying that King George III was never put into the line of kings. And why is that? Anybody want to guess? He lost America. He lost the colonies. So he's not one of the heroic kings of England. Let's go, once we leave the White Tower, we go to the inner ward here. 
but what are all these people lining up in front of the Waterloo Black? Well, of course, because they want to see the crown jewels. Well, <clears throat> what would you see in that exhibit? You would see the imperial state crown, such as this. Now, it consists of over 2,000 diamonds and 17 sapphires. Here's the St. Edward Sapphire, the Black Prince Ruby, which was obtained under, let's say, less than legitimate circumstances. And of course, you have the Cullinan II diamond, one of the stones cut from the largest diamond ever mined in the world. Now, mind you, all of the crown jewels that are in the jewel house, they are not insured. That came as a surprise to me, but when you think about it, no <clears throat> carrier would insure this collection, not even the Lloyds of London. So if you are planning a caper, this would be a good place because it's uninsured, but of course, highly protected by armed guards. Ah, here we have um, the now current monarch, King Charles III, wearing the imperial state crown immediately after his coronation. And he is holding a scepter that has the Cullinan one diamond, the largest diamond as you can see here on the right. But this is not the crown that was used to crown him at the moment of crowning. That was St. Edward's crown here. That is used only for coronations, as well as this collection of what is called the regalia, such as the scepter and the ampule that holds the sacred oil. Because when you ascend to the throne in England, not only are you the king or the queen, you are head of the Church of England as well. Let's go outside the Waterloo block into this area called the Tower Green, where unfortunately many people lost their head, literally. And here's a sculpture commemorating all those folks who were victims of beheadings. Now, <clears throat> a lot of them occurred during Henry VIII's rule, such as Anne Boleyn, Margaret Pohl. She was, uh, uh, her line was an heir to the throne. Got to get rid of her. Uh, Catherine Howard, one of Henry's wives, she was a young woman. Uh, she didn't believe that the king really was serious about marriage and took up her own affairs. Well, once he discovered that, off with her head. Lady Jane Grey and Robert Devereux, who was the favorite of Queen Elizabeth I. But as I say, he launched an army against her. So treason off with your head. All of these unfortunate victims are interred here on the grounds in the church of St. Peter at Vincula. Now, being executed on the Tower Green was really reserved for special people, deposed monarchs, uh, people who led uh, acts of treason, um, attempts on the lives of the monarchs. If you were a common criminal, a murderer, a thief, you were executed outside the walls on Tower Hill, adding insult to injury. Hmm? Well, let's go to Windsor. Remember, the most famous castle in the world, the largest and oldest occupied castle on earth. And here is the long walk up Home Park to the castle itself. You see the deer here wandering about? They are descendants of the actual herds that were there even when Henry VIII was on the throne. Let's take a look. So let's take a look inside. What would we, we find? Well, once again, built by William the Conqueror. He was busy, wasn't he? It started out as a mott and bailey, an earth and timber structure, but quickly he switched over to stone. It really is three wards. 
the upper ward, the middle ward, where you'll find that, that mat, and the lower ward, where you will find such things as the Kerfu Tower. And we'll take a look at that. So here's the upper ward. This is where the monarch spends time when they're on premises. And for Queen Elizabeth II, <clears throat> who just expired last year, this was her favorite place to spend on the weekends. You have to run a country Monday through Friday. Oh, let's get over to Windsor for a nice weekend. This is her entrance to her quarters, but um, visitors would come in through this. Now, if you are um, summoned for a audience with the queen, you would be received here in the grand reception room, decorated in the Rococo design. Well, now that you've had time to converse with the queen, uh, it's around lunchtime or dinner. So how about staying for dinner and eating at St. George's Hall here? Gothic design, 175 foot dining table. Well, after dinner, of course, you want to mingle with your other guests. So you're going to re go to the crimson drawing room, the green drawing room, and if there's an overflow crowd, uh, to the white drawing room. In the middle ward, you see that mat? And here's the round tower. Now today, the round tower is a repository for archival material. And here we are in the lower ward. Beautiful St. George's Chapel, the Kerfu Tower, and a number of other buildings. Mm -hmm. Now, what about that Kerfu Tower? Here we see the arrow slits, the crenellated top. It's also a clock tower. But guess what? It contains a secret exit called a sally port. So if the castle was ever under siege, the king, the queen, the entire court could escape through the sally port. It also is a bell tower. And the bells are rung manually, not digitally. Also, you'll find St. George's Chapel there, a beautiful chapel built in honor of St. George, the patron of England. Here you see from the inside out, the beautiful stained glass windows. It's been the venue for many occasions and celebrations, such as the marriage of Harry and Meghan, but more somber occasions as well and the final resting place of Queen Elizabeth, her husband, her parents, as well as her sister. Do we have castles here in the United States? Well, heck yeah. One of the biggest is in San Simeon, California, the Enchanted Hill. Located on the central coast of California, it's set back five miles from the Pacific Ocean, 1,600 feet above the ocean. And why was it built? Well, it was the brainchild of William Randolph Hearst, publishing tycoon. And he engaged a female architect, which was unheard of at the time, Julia Morgan. It was built between 1919 and 1947. Today it's part of the California State Park System and you can visit. Well, what about William? Hmm. He got the idea to build himself a castle um, <clears throat> and employed, as I said, Julia Morgan. She was an accomplished architect. She studied in the University of California system, went to France to study at the Ecole de Beaux Arts. She was the only female student admitted at the time. She graduated with high honors, returned to California and caught the eye of William Randolph Hearst to build that castle. So what did she do? Well, let's see what you'll find there. The Neptune pool, over 300,000 gallons of water, several different guest houses, La Casa Grande, 38 bedrooms. Well, when you have a castle, you have a lot of people over, right? You have to put them somewhere. And the indoor Roman pool on top is, of course, tennis courts. So let's look inside La Casa Grande. Of course, built in the Spanish mission style, each of castles in the various countries generally reflect the architecture. Here's the refectory, the dining room. What do we find here? French Gothic fireplace mantle, Tuscan lanterns for lighting, Spanish choir stalls on the sides of the walls, Flemish tapestries, Italian refractory table, King's ransom and fine silver. You know, William Randolph Hearst as a youngster, <clears throat> as a teenager traveled Europe the, on the grand tour with his mother. And he, because, that family was very wealthy. He collected all these things. He collected a fireplace. He collected 
the Spanish um, choir stalls. He put all that in storage because he knew one day he would have a castle. And so he did. And here he is. Here he is seated at the refectory table. Many rooms in Casa Grande, including here, um, the library, and along this shelf, uh, we have pottery from ancient Greece. And you see the coffered ceilings? Just like in France and Spain. Well, of course, you have people there. You got to entertain them. Let's say you have a billiard room and you have tapestries on the wall from France in the Millefleurs design. Very beautiful. Here, I was impressed with this, the indoor Roman pool. Blue Venetian mosaic tile laced with gold. And technically, this was never finished. The outdoor pool has a facade from a Greek temple. Now, what about William Randolph Hearst? You know, France, their castles was the story of <clears throat> monarchs and mistresses. Here, it's the story of millionaires and mistresses. He was married to the very lovely Millicent, who was from a very fine family on the East Coast. But she grew tired of his philandering and returned to the East Coast and had a life of her own. But no divorce. Divorce at that time was more scandalous than having a mistress. So she remained legally married to him until his death in 1951 and built an independent life for herself as a philanthropist. So where was Randolph's heart? It belonged to Marion Davies. Popular film actress, he lived openly with her at Hearst Castle. Here, but you know what, Marion didn't mind. Here she is with William. Here she acted as the hostess for the castle. She's with George Bernard Shaw and Charlie Chaplin. They were frequent guests at the castle. Now, just like Henry II, the gave Shinnesoke Chateau to Diane, <clears throat> William Randolph Hearst, he gave her, had this built, designed by once again, his architect. It's a 110 room beach house here when Marion wants a little private time. Do we have castles right here in the Midwest? Absolutely. How many of you ever heard of Loveland Castle outside of Cincinnati? One, okay. This has a very interesting history, although it was not built for defensive purposes. But I had the great pleasure of visiting that particular castle last November when I spent Thanksgiving with my husband's relatives. Well, it's located in Loveland, Ohio, 23 miles northeast of Cincinnati, sits on the banks of the Little Miami River, one and a half acres of land, and it's one-fifth the scale of an actual replica of a castle in France. Who built it? Well, Henry D. Andrews. He was a World War I veteran. When he returned back from service, he was a teacher, an educator, Sunday school teacher, and a medieval castle enthusiast. He built it by hand. Construction went slowly until the 1950s when he retired from teaching. Now, why did he build this castle? Well, first of all, he, built, he purchased the land, various lots, and he wanted it as a campsite for his Sunday school students. <laughs> no boy is right. But eventually, of course, living in tents uh, got a little bit old, so he wanted to build a more permanent structure. Well, he completed 98% of the construction by himself over a 50 year period. He carried an estimated 56,000 pails of stone, each, each pail about 65 pounds, by hand up from the river. He invested 23,000 hours of hard labor. And for his efforts, he received more than 50 marriage proposals from widows and old maids who wanted to live in the castle. Well, you know, he thought highly of his Sunday school students and knighted them. He created the Knights of the Golden Trail based on the Ten Commandments, which are inscribed right here on the wall, and based on the principles of chivalrous knighthood. And the purpose of the organization was to save modern civilization from degradation and degeneration, just as the noble knights saved Europe during the Dark Ages. And in commemoration of uh, Mr. Andrew's 100th birthday, they opened up the North Wing where you will find suits of armor and a nice collection of replica swords 
um, Excalibur's in there as well. Here on the second floor, you have the refectory, leads out to a covered porch or loggia. But what about Mr. Andrews? You know, building the castle is one thing, but his entire life was even more fascinating. And let me share a few moments as we wrap it up this evening. World War I broke out. He was a young man living in Ohio, and he enlisted. He was sent off to Fort Dix in New Jersey, where he was training. But unfortunately, there was an outbreak of spinal meningitis. Now, at that time, there was no therapy for that particular condition. And many of the recruits expired, and including him. So <clears throat> Department of Defense, immediately sent home word to his family that he was um, expired due to an illness. And that was shared with the entire community. Meanwhile, he was uh, in the morgue for a couple days, as well as others who expired. They took him out and decided, well, we're gonna do a little dissection because we wanna know more about this disease. So they took a, a, a sample uh, from the roof of his mouth and they noticed he was bleeding. So if you know anything about <clears throat> cadavers, they don't bleed. So immediately the physician says, Lord Almighty, this, this boy is alive. He's not dead. Get him out of here. Well, he was unconscious and he was paralyzed. Of course, he couldn't speak on his own behalf. And they said, well, what are we going to do? Well, let's try out something new. How about a shot of adrenaline to the heart? And don't you know, it worked. They revived him. Initially, he was a bit um, comatose and blind, but they got him back up on his feet and sent him off to Europe to serve in World War I. After all of that, but before he left, um, they, he did act as a blood donor and they were able to recover antibodies from his blood because he had natural immunity to, to uh, spinal meningitis. Well, over there, he's serving in Europe as a, a paramedic, interesting enough, right? And serving in the troops, fighting along with the allies, the British and the French forces. He actually stayed in Europe for a while after World War I and studied at <clears throat> the Toulouse University where he took up architecture. And when he returned to the United States, he decided to act as an educator and he actually had built the castle there on the banks of the Little Miami oh, oh, River. So ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the end of my didactic portion. Before we entertain questions or comments, and I hope we have a few, I wanna thank my husband in the front row here. <laughs> for his support in helping me develop the program. And of course, we want, I would like to thank uh, Gail Borden Public Library for inviting me. So now the late queen and I will take questions. Do we have any? 